And what I'm about to read is found, excerpts of it in all four Gospels. Then Pilate called together the leading priests and other religious leaders along with the people. And he announced his verdict. You brought this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I have examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence, and I find him innocent. Herod Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. Nothing this man has done calls for the death penalty. So instead, I will have him flogged, and then I will release him. Then a mighty roar rose from the crowd, and with one voice they shouted, Kill him, and release Barabbas to us. Pilate argued with them, because he wanted to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! And for a third time he demanded, Why? What crime has he committed? I have found no reason to sentence him to death. So again, I will have him flogged, and then I will release him. The mob shouted louder and louder, demanding that Jesus be crucified. Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water. And he washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. And all the people, all the people yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death, we and our children. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. And he ordered Jesus to be flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Some of Governor Pilate's soldiers took Jesus to their headquarters and called out the entire regiment, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and they placed it on his head and then they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter and then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and they grabbed that very stick and they struck him repeatedly on the head. When they were finally tired of mocking him, of beating him, They took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. Along the way, they came across a man named Simon who was from Cyrene, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. And they went out to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. The soldiers gave Jesus wine mixed with bitter gall, and when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. And when they came to the place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross, and the two criminals were also crucified, one on his right, one on his left. After they had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. A sign was fastened above Jesus' head, announcing the charge against him, and it read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Jesus looked towards heaven and said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The crowd watched. The leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself. If he really is God's Messiah, the chosen one, 
The soldiers mocked him too by offering him drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you are king of the Jews, then save yourself. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, So you're the Messiah? Are you? Well, prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God? Even when you have been sentenced to die, we deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, I assure you that today you will be with me in paradise. By this time, it was about noon. And darkness fell across the whole land till three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone. And Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why? Have you abandoned me? And suddenly the ground shook and the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. It is finished. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what happened, he worshiped God. And he said, truly, this man was the son of God. And when all the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw what had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, his friends, including the woman who had followed him from Galilee, his friends stood at a distance watching. We have heard this story probably countless times. And for me, it never gets old. For me, as I read all four gospel accounts over and over this week, new things began to appear to me that I hadn't noticed before. But I started thinking about Jesus' last breath. Have you ever witnessed someone taking their last breath? It can be both eerie and powerful. It can be a little sobering um, as well. And I have thought countless times what it must have been like to be there on that day when Jesus said what he did, but then took his last breath and gave up his spirit. Just a minute ago, I read where it said that his friends stood at a distance watching when you stand at a distance watching this scene play out what do you see what do you see I imagine if I were to go around the room we would all probably mention something different and maybe some things that are similar but I started thinking of that phrase what do I see Jesus, when I stand here watching your story be read and play out before me, what are you showing me? Because I, like these people in the story, it says that they were your friends. And you have told me that because I have placed my trust in you and received you, you are my friend. (laughs) You know, the Apostle Paul does such a great job in his letters 
on telling us what he sees. And just a couple things I want to read to you. One found in Romans 3, Paul says this. He says, Now we see how God does make us acceptable to him. The law and the prophets tell how we become acceptable, and it isn't by obeying the law of Moses. God treats everyone alike. He accepts people only because they have faith in Jesus Christ. And all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But God treats us much better than we deserve. And because of Christ Jesus, he freely accepts us and sets us free from our sins. God sent Christ to be our sacrifice. Christ offered his life blood so that by faith in him, we could come to God and God did this to show that in the past he was right to be patient and forgive sinners this also shows that God is right when he accepts people who have faith in his son Jesus Paul writes in Romans 8 so if the son sets you free you are truly free. The cross of Jesus sets us free, amen? The cross plus Jesus equals freedom for anyone, everyone who would take him up on this incredible offer. Romans 5, Paul writes this. He says, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When you stand there watching, what do you see? The cross plus Jesus sets us free equals freedom. The cross of Jesus sets us free, but it sets us free to something. And when I began to think of this and pray about it, I was like, Lord, what will you reveal to me today? And the first thing he revealed to me is this, is that the cross of Jesus sets us free to respond to Jesus. You see, uh, before, when we read the Old Testament, they were freaked out if God showed himself. They were like, I am not worthy. And you know what? We're still not worthy. But Jesus says, because of my finished work on the cross, I declare you worthy. You were once unrighteous, And I traded my righteousness and took on your unrighteousness so that you could respond to God. No longer do we need a high priest. No longer do we have to go to or through someone to get to God. Jesus says, I am giving you a backstage pass. I'm gonna rip that veil in two and you get to enter in the Holy of Holies and talk to God face to face. What an amazing gift he gives us And it's all because of the cross. The cross sets us free to respond to Jesus. John 20, 29, and when Jesus, he he dies, he rises again, and he appears to his disciples, and Thomas is doubting. Thomas is like, I don't believe this. I'm not gonna believe till I see the nail prints, till I touch him, till I know it's true. And so Thomas gets this played out. He sees this, and he's like, oh, Lord, Master, I believe. And here's what it says in John 20, 29. Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me (laughs) that second half of that verse is us he says that we are blessed because we believe and we have not seen we did not get to touch we did not get to put our fingers through the nail holes in his wrists and in his feet we didn't get to see the scar in his side But it says that when we believe because we have not seen, we are blessed and we're blessed to respond to him. The cross of Jesus sets us free to respond to Jesus. It sets us free to belong to Jesus. 
If you've ever felt somewhere or out of place like you did not belong, I am telling you those days are over because Jesus says that you belong and we belong because of his sacrifice on the cross for us. The verse here in Romans 5 says this. It says, and since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. We are free to respond We are free to belong to Jesus. We become his children. We become God's friend because Jesus willingly going to the cross to make that happen. Hmm. We are (laughs) the cross of Christ. The cross of Jesus sets us free to be made new in and for Jesus be made new so many times we refer to ourselves by our sin and who, or who we used to be instead of referring to who we are right now you know this, this, this saying has been going around for quite some time I mean it's years and it says that this the, the, the world knows your name but calls you by your sin sometimes we fall into that trap right but here's the thing is that Jesus knows your sin and he calls you by your name such a beautiful thing and he says you are made new in me through me for me 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person and the old life is gone and the new life has begun The cross of Jesus, Hmm. what it does for us is that we get to love Jesus, others, and ourselves. 1 John 5 says this, it says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. We know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. We are free to love Jesus, love others, and love ourselves. And the final one I have there is this, that we are free because of Jesus' cross to live with and for a purpose. He gives us that. Him dying on the cross gives us a a purpose uh, to be with and to live for. Colossians 1, 19 through 23 says this. It says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by the means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you, me, us, who were once far away from God. You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now, now Jesus has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. First Peter, Peter writes this, for as a believer, 
you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you may follow in his footsteps. The cross of Christ compels us. It's supposed to compel us to live. It frees us to live with and for his great purpose. So as you stand there watching, what do you see? I encourage you, don't miss a step. Don't skip a step. But take him up on his offer. And most of us have. That's probably why we're here. But you know what? I could take that offer for granted sometimes. And I love how he is pulling me back to remind me of his great love, which frees me for not just these things, but so much more. So again, as his friends, as you stand there watching, what do you see?